Well, thank you for joining my school lecture. This is the eighth edition this calendar year, and we're just excited uh, to have Pretty Sivasankar to uh, give us the concluding West School lecture for 2023. Uh, on a high note, hopefully we don't have to sing it because uh, we heard our voice. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to find a way to connect to the sure. theme of the day. Uh, and uh, uh, you know that we have an outstanding speech, language, and hearing science department uh, in HHS. And uh, Preeti is also the department head. Um, you know, I often wonder, in fact, I just did some commercial for you, actually, who were at the virtual town hall. Uh, earlier today. We tried, but we couldn't. It uh, was capped out. Because we, I guess, uh, we uh, had a 300 limit yes. on Zoom. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so how many of you tried to access, but couldn't get it? Okay, all right. Well, sorry about that. I, uh, you know, I didn't know that our budget is so tight. That, uh, <laughs> the 500 won't cost more. Right? And we haven't done a virtual town hall in a while, I guess, so we thought that. Enough. But anyway. My point being that I was doing some commercial uh, for PT to say, hey, the Westwood Lecture continues. We have one more this afternoon, and all of you, you know, I was co-teaching a class semester, and you worry about your voice. Now there's a much deeper set of questions than that as well. So delighted to uh, welcome PT uh, to talk about voice and the science behind it. Thank you. Thank you, President Chang. <laughs> It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my honor. Thank you for the invitation. And it's really nice to see so many familiar and friendly faces in the audience. Um, so the answer to this question is yes, we can protect our voices. So we are done, I guess. And we can enjoy some beverages and food. But what I'd like to do over the next 45 minutes, perhaps, is talk a little bit about the why and how. But um, before, we do, before we get there to the topic of the day, um, President Chang mentioned that I'm the Department Head of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences. So, of course, I need to take a minute, maybe a little more, to tell you about all the wonderful things about the department. So you may know that we are very highly ranked. We are ranked number three for speech language pathology. Uh, we are the top ranked program in the state of Indiana. And all programs ranked higher than us have a medical school. So we are the only, the, we are the only university with a non-medical, doesn't have a medical school uh, with such high ranking. And similarly for our audiology program, again, we are in the top 10, we are ranked number nine. We are the highest ranked program in the state of Indiana. And again, programs ranked higher than us uh, have medical schools or are, are in very large metropolitan areas. So we're very proud of our, of our legacy in this area. Uh, the department touches upon all three missions of a public land grant. We are very invested in discovery, learning, and engagement. Our MD steer clinics for speech, language, hearing, and swallow are busy throughout the year. In 2022 alone, the audiology clinic saw over 5,000 appointments, 30% of them being pediatric. And in our speech, language, and swallow clinics, we had over 6,000 appointments, 50% being pediatric. So you get the sense for how busy we are and what a significant and substantive imprint we have in our community. But we are also really recognized for our excellent research. So, you know, when I, um, when I typically talk to a layperson about what department I'm affiliated with, most often on the flight to the passenger sitting next to me, I'll say, oh, I'm in the I work in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences. And invariably, they will turn to me and say, oh, yeah, I knew a speech therapist when I was in elementary school, right? And of course, it's a very essential mission that we embrace. We are dedicated to training the next generation of clinicians who will provide services uh, for speech language in our school system. But we also do some very mechanistic uh, based research asking really critical questions about the causes of communication and swallowing disorders, how to assess them and how to treat them. The majority of our funding comes from the National Institutes of Health, though our department also has funding from the NSF, the DOD and the Department of Education. Um, I also, uh, since July, 
have been working in the Office of Research, really trying to um, increase our health sciences extramurally funded portfolio. So I thought wearing that lens, I would give you a little snapshot about the breadth of research we do. This is just a snapshot of the NIH funded research in the department. And as you can see, it's pretty extensive and diverse. We ask questions about the causes, the neurophysiology um, of swallowing and language disorders and how to best assess and treat them. We use animal models to ask really mechanistic questions about the onset of hearing loss and voice problems. We have a very significant presence in understanding questions that affect pediatric language development. And we're asking questions about why children develop language disorders, how we can best assess them, treat them, what are the factors that cause these language disorders to persist, and also looking at the underlying neural mechanisms. And of course, we have a deep dedication to training the next generation of scientists. And what you see on this slide are three training grants that our Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences supports. The first training grant um, is from the Department of Education, and it is focused towards our graduate clinicians and helps them learn how to engage in interprofessional education and interprofessional practice. And then we have two other training grants, both from the National Institutes of Health, that are focused on doctoral and postdoctoral scholars. And we're really looking to um, set up a very robust pipeline for these individuals to position them for success in both academic and industrial settings. What you see um, pictured in each of these slides were the faces of the PI. Of course, we recognize that research is interdisciplinary. It's very collaborative as well. But you've invited me to talk to you about how we can protect our voice, how we can really have a healthy and resilient voice to prevent voice disorders. Because voice disorders are really quite common. One in 13 Americans has a voice disorder. Voice disorders are expensive to treat. Direct healthcare costs exceed $13 billion a year in the US alone. Voice disorders can also significantly reduce quality of life. Individuals with voice disorders tend to have social isolation, they report depression. And it can have a high societal cost as well. Studies have shown that when children learn from teachers with voice disorders, their learning tends to be more impaired, they retain less information. So again, just a few data to show that voice disorders can have a very substantive negative impact on individuals. So individuals in my lab um, look, are looking at understanding why voice disorders develop. And we take mechanistic-based approaches to really understand the pathophysiology of voice disorders. We're also interested in understanding why some speakers might develop a voice problem. And I'll talk a little bit more about these specific phenotypes. Long term, we hope that understanding more about voice disorders will help us drive policy for safe voice use, like in many occupational settings. So many occupational settings have certain thresholds for what is considered safe use, but we don't have something like this in voice. And that's one of our long term goals. And then, of course, greater mechanistic understanding of voice disorders will help us develop better treatments that can more effectively resolve and target these conditions. But let me introduce you to voice disorders by talking a little bit about the anatomy um, behind and the structures behind voice production. So voice is produced by a structure called the larynx. The larynx is a cartilaginous structure. It's found in the front of the neck. It's located right above the windpipe or the trachea. Now, the larynx occupies some really prime real estate. It's the Westwood of West Lafayette, <laughs> right? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I more like walk. Uh, <laughs> well, let's say it's the Lyles Porter Hall of South Campus. <laughs> That's where the department is. And the reason it's such prime real estate in the body is because it sits at the junction of the airway and the digestive tract. In other words, close to the aerodigestive tract. 
And this is important because what this also means is that the larynx is now susceptible or vulnerable to challenges that may affect the airway and challenges coming from the digestive tract. So think about everything we inhale, small particulates, pollution, cigarette smoke. Think about challenges coming from the digestive tract, reflux. All these challenges can also affect the larynx. Now within the larynx, we have two folds of tissue called the vocal folds. And you see them here as white bands on both these schematics. On the top schematic, you see the vocal folds having what's called an open position. They are apart from each other. And this is the configuration when we are breathing, inhaling and exhaling. And the lower configuration you see is when the vocal folds are closed, which is the configuration we adopt when we swallow. Now, when we voice, our vocal folds are vibrating back and forth. Now, at this time, I'm going to differentiate voice from speech because this is an important distinction when we examine and study the voice. So when I, meant, when I talk about voice, what I mean is the air coming from the lungs that's building under these vocal folds, that's pushing these vocal folds apart, and the vocal folds then start vibrating in a self-sustained manner. The vocal folds modulate that air coming from the lungs, and that modulated airflow is voice. The modulated airflow then propagates up the vocal tract, so downstream from the lungs, and radiates through the mouth and nose. And this airflow is then molded into sounds by the tongue, the palate, the lips, the teeth, and that is speech. So speech is about the sounds that we recognize in different languages. Voice is basically that modulated airflow that's at the level of the larynx. So of course, we use a variety of voices to communicate, but so do many other animals, right? Animals are also using sounds to communicate. And this is why animals form a really good model to understand the larynx and voice disorders, specifically the pathophysiology of voice. And in our lab in collaboration, we have looked at a variety of species, humans of course, but also pigs, rabbits, and rats. Because these animals have a larynx that is very similar in anatomy and physiology to the human larynx. These species also have larynges that have a very similar biochemical and biomolecular profile to the human larynx. And hence they provide us a really nice template to understand what is happening um, in terms of the biology of human voice production as well. Okay, so we're back to the vocal folds. Um, and here I will say a couple more things. So again, what you see on your left are the vocal folds open when we inhale and exhale. And what you see on your right are the vocal folds closed, which is what happens when we swallow. Now, the vocal folds are about a half inch in length on average. They tend to be longer and thicker in men. They tend to be um, shorter in women and really short in children. And that's one of the reasons you can tell someone's age and biological sex by just hearing their voice. In other words, the voice is very distinct and actually is part of our unique identity, much like a fingerprint. So there are researchers across the country who are looking at vocal identity as a hallmark of distinct personalities as well. Here you see an animation of vocal fold vibration. Of course, this is a you know, two-dimensional animation. And what you can see is airflow that would come up from the lungs that would set the vocal folds into this back and forth self-sustained oscillation. What you also see on this schematic is this multi-layered tissue structure that makes the vocal folds. So the vocal folds have an outer epithelium, an, an intermediate mucosa, and then an underlying muscle. And you can see the vocal folds coming together from bottom to top. And as they do so, the space between the vocal fold assumes a divergent and convergent shape. And it's this kind of divergent and convergent shape and the ensuing aerodynamics that support the self-sustained vibration. The vocal folds are vibrating hundreds of times per second, really, really fast. So you can imagine that that collision 
and that contact pressure may have something to do with voice disorders. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But something that's really fascinated me about the voice is that this is the one source that we all have, and we can produce a variety of sounds using this one source. Maybe. Does someone form a rainbow? When the sunlight summon form a rainbow. When the sunlight strikes a rainbow. Okay. Audio wasn't great. But the point there was to highlight that was one speaker saying the same sentence with the same larynx, but it sounded really different. So we have one source that can produce a variety of different sounds, all because of the biomechanics at the source of vibration itself. So in other words, what we do when we speak is we are actively contracting and stretching those vocal fold tissue. We are manipulating how much contact there is in the vertical or medial, or medial surfaces. And in doing so, we can produce a variety of different sounds. This is not something we are taught, right? This is just something we learn over the course of development. We kind of learn how to manipulate the structure in order to produce a variety of voices. And I'll come back to that, but I just want to illustrate why this organ, so to speak, has fascinated me now for 25 years, right? It's this really small organ, it's this niche tissue, but it can do so very much. So. It's, uh, it's been fun. Okay. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. <laughs> this is going to kind of, yeah, the ghost-like apparition, yeah. Okay. All right. And now I'm going to play you a video of what the vocal folds really look like. Um, so again, the vocal folds are vibrating very, very fast, hundreds of times per second. And what you'll see is a slow, is a slowed down stroboscopic image. So you can actually see vocal fold motion and you can see that active uh, contracting and stretching. So I hope you notice a couple things. One, the vocal folds are actively contracting and stretching. B, they are colliding many, many times, slowed down again, so you can't see the number of collisions. Um, and C, you can produce very, very different qualities perceptually just based on how you're manipulating the dynamics at that local level. So you can imagine why traditional hypotheses about the causes of voice disorders have kind of converged on this idea of collisions causing voice problems. So the hypothesis in the field is that collisions between the vocal folds result in high contact pressures. When these contact pressures are large and when they are sustained, a voice disorder develops. So if you think about events or speaking conditions where you might have high collision, high contact pressure, you might be thinking about singing and stage performances, right? And then no wonder when I Google celebrities with voice disorders, you get a long list. And this list is organized by date of birth. <laughs> but, but let me give you some, let me read out some examples. Miley Cyrus, Adele, Selena Gomez, Whoopi Goldberg, Rod Stewart, Frank Sinatra, right? Clearly, the voice disorder is not discriminating by genre of, of music either, right? Um, and then, when I Googled further, I found some really interesting, entertaining headlines. So I'll read you a couple. When you work as hard as these singers do, sometimes it takes a toll. Here's one about the number of singers who've undergone vocal surgery. It could end someone's career. There's this concept of why voice disorders keep coming back. And this one's interesting. In the 25 billion video game industry, voice actors face broken vocal cords. 
So the vocal cords are false and they can't break, but clearly this is a condition that has wide impact. But does this mean that only elite individuals are going to have voice problems? Is this something we should care about if we don't sing, if we don't perform? Well, not quite, right? There are behaviors like this one. Okay, I'll try and stop this, I'm not sure how. <laughs> I also wanted to make sure I could wake everyone up. <laughs> Not sure how to stop this. I will just minimize the volume. <laughs> um, I actually, that would be a better idea. Yes, indeed I can. Um, so. <laughs> So clearly this is something on YouTube because I just put in screaming YouTube and came up with many, many videos. This is clearly a pastime. But that's a behavioral strategy we do not want. If you scream as much as those folks did, you will have a voice disorder, right? But it just, it's not only really about screaming. We can think about other daily activities where there's sustained and loud voice use that may also cause a voice problem, right? As we can see from this schematic. <laughs> But what's fascinated me, this was the initial hypothesis for voice disorders that I showed you. What's fascinated me is that, well, of those sports fans, not everyone's gonna get a voice problem. Only some of them will. So clearly, it's not just screaming loudly. It's just not using a loud voice that's causing a voice problem. There's something more to this, right? So this kind of framework for the causes of voice disorders is incomplete, it's too simplistic. So individuals in the lab really try to ask deeper questions. And we've been asking whether there are certain factors that can prime the vocal fold tissue to then be susceptible to the mechanical stress. So what are some factors that are changing the milieu of the vocal folds and thereby causing the likelihood of damage from mechanical stress to happen? Those are some of the questions we ask. And we do this, of course, in a variety of species. You see some examples here. Uh, we've used pigs, rabbits, we've used rats, and then of course we um, study humans as well. We've been fortunate to do this work for a long time because we've had consistent funding from the National Institutes of Health, and we've really had excellent collaborators. And I want to just call out two really important collaborators, Dr. Abby Cox, who is an associate professor in the Department of Comparative Pathobiology, in the College of Veterinary Medicine. And I've really had um, the privilege of collaborating with really stellar folks and colleagues in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering, one of them who's here today, Dr. Greg Gorgian. Thank you, Greg. And we've also had the opportunity to collaborate um, across the country, uh, well, and North America. Um, and these collaborations have really helped us um, ask some really interesting questions about how we can protect the voice. And here's the answer. So there are many things we can do to protect the voice. We can adopt really healthy lifestyles where we think about sleep, what we eat. We can think about how we warm up and cool down the voice prior to significant voice hues. We can think about vocal naps, and I'll give you a few um, examples and some research behind why we need to rest our voice. It's really important to use amplification when you are teaching in large lecture rooms, so make sure you do that. Um, and then there are other things we can do, such as humidifying the room where we're sleeping, thinking more about nose, nose breathing versus mouth breathing, um, thinking about how we can um, target sleep apnea so that the airway is more humidified and so on. <coughs> how do we know this? Well, because um, our collaborations and our studies have shown that, that there are a variety of things we can do to understand the biology of voice production and the biological changes happening to tissue. And some of the methodologies we have looked at include looking at vocal fold motion, aerodynamics, acoustics, histology, immunohistochemistry, immun immunofluorescence. We have been able to do imaging with MR and ultrasound, 
and we use proteomics and transcriptomics to ask some really fundamental mechanistic questions about the pathophysiology of voice disorders. And I will give you an example of these data by talking about hydration. Okay, so let's just do a quick exercise because that screaming was a while ago, so yeah, <laughs> everyone's drifting off again. Okay, so let's say your throat feels scratchy, right? I'm gonna give you a minute to kind of feel this. There's like an itch in the back of your throat. There's a lump, right? Now, if you're as suggestible as I am, you're probably already feeling something back there. Okay, what do you want to do to clear it? You would cough. Anything else? You might drink some water. Thank you. Right. So you might cough. These are my colleagues in the department, by the way. You might drink some water, right? But what if I were to tell you that the water you drank did not go anywhere near your larynx? Because if it did, you would cough. Well, I don't need to play that for you. You know what a cough sounds like, right? <laughs> so the water does not enter your larynx, and still you feel better. Okay. Just to illustrate that point, I'm going to show you one more video. Okay. This is a video from my colleague, Dr. Malandraki's lab, uh, uh, Georgia Study Swallowing Disorders. And this is a, a swallow video of a healthy young adult who is drinking some water. And you see the water shown here in this darker, in this darker area. It's now held in the mouth. I'll just orient you. Here's the airway. Here's the esophagus. So this is the digestive tract. And you will notice that as you swallow, the liquid is going into the esophagus. It's not going anywhere near the larynx. Okay, so just visual proof that when you drink water, it doesn't enter your larynx and you still feel better. So does hydration not matter then? One way we've looked at this question is through the lens of dehydration. So we have asked, okay, when the body gets dehydrated, do your vocal folds get dehydrated? And is vocal fold dehydration bad, right? We've asked, there are different ways to get dehydrated. You may be dehydrated because you take diuretic medication. You might be dehydrated because you are in an environment where the air is not very humid. You might get dehydrated because you don't consume as much water or you are fasting intermittently. There are different ways to get dehydrated. And we've asked, okay, what's happening to the biological properties of tissue depending on how you get dehydrated? We have asked, okay, once you're dehydrated, what next? How do you rehydrate? Does rehydration restore the biological properties back to pre-dehydration levels? Is there a better way to rehydrate? Is there a less efficient way to rehydrate? And then we've looked at the interaction of factors. We've looked at the interaction of aging and dehydration, the interaction of vocal fold healing and dehydration. So I'll just tell you a little bit more about those studies. So first we asked, okay, the, when the body gets dehydrated, do the vocal folds get dehydrated? The answer is yes. And we showed this through proton density weighted MR imaging. And we also showed that recovery from dehydration depends on the extent of dehydration in the first place. So if the dehydration is not too substantive, then the tissue gets restored very quickly. If the dehydration is very significant, it takes much longer for the tissue to get rehydrated. We have shown that vocal fold dehydration has adverse biological effects, specifically that outer layer of vocal fold tissue, that epithelium, tends to get leaky. It loses integrity. And if the epithelium were to lose integrity, that makes the <coughs> tissue overall more susceptible to things you might inhale and exhale. We have shown that pharmaceuticals can dehydrate the vocal folds, and this affects the outermost tissue layer, but it also affects the architecture of the vocal fold tissue. We have shown that exposures for just eight hours to low humidity can cause cellular stress in the vocal folds. And that when these low humidity exposures persist, there are changes to the muscle structure and function as well. We have shown that rehydration can mitigate or restore the tissue to pre-dehydration pre levels, but it really depends on the extent of dehydration in the first place. We have shown that when the vocal folds get older, the effects of dehydration are more severe. 
So aging vocal folds are more vulnerable to dehydration. And we have shown that when the vocal folds are dehydrated, they don't heal as optimally as when they are not dehydrated. So I just showed you examples from dehydration. But collectively, through many years of work, our research has shown that dehydration is creating a milieu in the larynx and in the vocal folds that's making them more susceptible to the mechanical stresses that are inherent in speaking. And what I haven't shown you is data that we have done on reflux and smoke that also appears to create this milieu that's detrimental to, voice, to voicing and voice production. But based on these studies, we are able to feel confident in these evidence-based recommendations for what we can do to protect our voices. But we know that voicing by its very nature is mechanical stresses, right? We have already shown you that the vocal folds are oscillating many hundreds of times per second. So mechanical stress is inherent in voice production. So the question is, okay, if the vocal folds are going to be subject to such high mechanical stress, how best do we restore the voice? So one question we have looked at is, trying to understand how quickly we can induce a voice change, a negative voice change. And we have found repeatedly through many different studies that we can induce negative voice changes in as little as 10 minutes. So when you adopt a non-habitual voice pattern, you speak differently than you speak habitually, you can have negative changes within 10 minutes. And we're using this paradigm to really understand how individuals compensate for these negative changes. Because the hypothesis is if you don't compensate, um, there are different ways of compensating. And you could compensate less optimally than others and thereby be at risk for long-term voice problems. But we've also asked other questions that are more relevant to this group. So let's say you are teaching in Stewart, in Stewart Hall. Right? And then you have, you, have a, you have one hour for lunch, and then you have to go to walk and teach another class. Right? <laughs> what should you do in that one hour to reset your voice? What should you do to protect your voice? <clears throat> and what we have found is that if you don't have any voice problems, if you have a fairly resilient, robust voice, then you are well served by just resting your voice and not doing much else. In contrast to resting your voice, you could actually do some voice therapy exercises. And the voice therapy exercises would help you long term in supporting that very resilient voice. But in the moment, just resting your voice and not using it is going to be adequate to reset your laryngeal system. However, if you already report voice problems, so you tend to get fatigued after voice use, you tend to get tired vocally after speaking, then those vocal rests are not going to do anything for you. And instead, what you need to be doing is resetting your larynx and your laryngeal system with more dedicated, active exercises that support low-level mobilization of vocal full tissue. So you should be seeing a speech-language pathologist mm -hmm. if that were the case, right? But the idea is that there are different strategies to reset your system and the strategies that you use can be personalized to you based on your phenotype and how you use your apparatus to speak. So from our human subject studies, we have, been, we have been able to show that one can effectively reset the laryngeal system and protect the voice after overuse, but that we also need to be identifying what vocal phenotype you may have, because that's the best way that we can personalize strategies for you as a speaker. But again, overall, these findings are really helping us drive the best recommendation for each speaker. So in the interest of having plenty of time for questions, um, I just want to end with some images of um, the many individuals who worked in the lab. Uh, I've been at Purdue for 17 years, um, so we've had a long history of folks in the lab who've been really helping us understand some of these questions. And with that, I will take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I better not 
not uh, say too many words. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> keeping myself hydrated. Yeah. <laughs> right way here. So, very interesting. Very interesting. So uh, let's open to questions, please. Last night, I think you spoke at Nietzsche said that the poster. Yes. 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 Where I'm in the so you'll often see in old movies the opera singer who sprays something in your mouth, or <laughs> even when you think about the or septic or cough drops. Um, do those really do anything, or is it not really about the voice? Yeah, so, so we don't really quite know the answer to that question. So, so some of them can just be like a topical anesthetic. So sometimes that can help you kind of reduce your, your sense of just itchiness or discomfort in the larynx. So it can help from that standpoint. Um, but there's really no um, direct evidence right now to show that it's doing, um, it's directly impacting the larynx, so to speak. Now, now the upper airway is a, is a fairly densely innovated structure. Um, but what those, what those cough drops are doing is kind of, you know, locally anesthetizing a certain area, uh, which is why it feels better after that. Yes, Sarah. So I have a question, practical one. Um, what's the average human limit on talking? So if I give a lecture five hours a day, five days a week, I think I'm going to lose my voice. So, what would be the limit? Right. So that's one of the F, well, that's one of the things we are trying to understand is what would be a threshold that we could apply across speakers. Mm -hmm. The answer to your question is there really is no magic number because we all speak in very different ways. So I'll give you an example. So let's say in a lecture we want to be loud, right? There are there are three or four ways that we can be loud, and we all adopt different strategies. So one strategy to be loud is to take a deeper breath each time. And that deeper breath is going to cause more elastic recoil. It's going to increase the pressure that's driving those vocal folds into oscillation. The other thing you can do to be loud is you can use, you can open your mouth more. And by opening the mouth more, you are more effectively radiating sound out. Those are fairly healthy strategies. What's not healthy, but what many people do, is we squeeze the vocal folds to get loud. So we increase, the, um, we increase the amount of approximation between the vocal folds, we increase medial contact. And when we do that, we also get loud, but now we are stressing out that tissue. So all three are effective at getting loud, but only two of those three are effective for long-term sustenance of healthy voice which is why there's no magic answer to how much. It depends on what phenotype you are adopting in order to speak. How are you getting loud in a lecture? And is that the right, is that the healthiest, is that the most resilient approach? And the only way we can do that is if we measure each one, each person, and determine what their phenotype is. Does that answer your question? Yeah. But in general, I would not recommend that anyone speak for that long without vocal rest and without vocal exercises that help reset the system. And there are very specific exercises we can, we can offer. Craig, did, I, did you have a question? I have a question. <coughs> Just curious, with the prevalence of vaping increasing, yes. how does that affect vocal folds? Do you have any idea? Yeah, there have been reports. It's not something I have studied, but actually Beth, uh, Beth Erickson, who was in my lab and is now, uh, who was my first PhD student and now at Stanford, she actually studies vaping and she uses mice. Um, and she has found that vaping creates this inflammatory milieu that, um, that has some downstream, downstream effects on. Yeah. yeah, it seems to be, it's not like the heat or anything, it's actually the, the composition. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sure. um, ever since I was a little boy, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering uh, about one of the fairy tales, and it's about the big bad wolf and the seven little goats. And in that fairy tale, uh, the wolf is trying to get into the house where the little goats have to eat right. them. And one of his tricks is to eat chalk to make his voice sound like the mother coming home. And I, uh, ever since, I always wondered. I've never eaten chalk. <laughs> <laughs> I've breathed a lot of chalk as a professor over the years.
voice, but, but <laughs> is there something to <laughs> to make to modulate your voice by 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 eating certain Thanks. No, I guess that's why it's a fairy tale because yeah. it's, it's 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 mythical. Um, no, because as as you as you saw in that moving video, when you eat something, it's bypassing the airway; it's going directly into the digestive tract. Now, there are ways, of course, that you can change your voice, and you know the 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 audio didn't play great. But that was the whole idea, is that with that same apparatus, we can adjust things like how much contact the vocal folds make, how. Uh, how stiff they are, how long they are, and that can itself change our voice quality. So it doesn't really have to do as much with diet as much as what we can do locally as speakers to alter the, the biomechanics of how the vocal folds are vibrating, if that makes sense. But you, you, you raise another point, which is um, there are laryngeal surgeons who can manipulate the tissue for example, if you want to feminize your voice, there are ways you can do that. When you think about gender affirming surgeries, you can do surgical manipulations to the tissue in order to make the voice sound more congruent with your identified gender. So there are other ways to do it, but it's not through diet. Yeah. Lawrence. So you talked about the behavior yeah. of positive and You talked about environmental factors. Are there other dimensions, say, as genetics that may come into how, how well a voice can perform under the same circumstances? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and there's the epigenetics, right? It's, it's how things are interacting, most definitely. Um, what my lab focuses on are these environmental triggers that can then, that, that can then have you know, downstream effects, but absolutely. Most definitely. Genetics is also explains why you, know, you and your sibling may sound really alike, right? Um, when, if someone were to just hear your voice. It also explains why some people are singers and some are not. Uh, so yeah, so, so there, there is of course the element of training and practice, but there's also the inherent anatomy. Yeah, Pablos. <laughs> When was actually we see the immersion of the patient for 10 minutes in hydration to make to see if the time is actually measured in states of the correct? Yes. Does this translate that within those 10 minutes I had actual changes in the mechanical properties of the I would be hard pressed to think what else it could be if it were in that. Do we have the evidence of that? No, we do not. We do not. Because one of the challenges, of course, is with the humans, you can't really get much else outside of what you can measure. And with animals, you can't induce voluntary phonation. Uh -huh. Now, we, we are part of a collaboration where we've, um, where we've trained the pigs to, to, phone, to grunt on demand. But grunting has a sl slightly different biomechanical origin than some of the other squealing behaviors that pigs have. Um, so that's not a question we've been able to directly answer, but I'm hard pressed to think how it cannot be the mechanics. Yeah. Yes. So I have a question that may not sound serious, but I'm really interested yeah. in the answer. What's Mom's secret? Because he's got a, <laughs> is that genetic? <laughs> of course. How does he do something? <laughs> Mom's well, secret, uh, secret juice, everyone. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, Mom would have to answer that question. <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, well, I, I, you're, you're a runner, I correct? I, uh, I, you run. Uh, oh, you I used to. run, I used to. <laughs> It's a combination of running and ice cream. <laughs> I did it. I, I, yes, I will. And I do read the Purdue Exponent, which is why I know that, and the flavor of ice cream as well. No, but the point here is that conditioning the respiratory muscles can actually help. So having a strong core is actually going to help you sustain your voice for a long time. Yeah. So exercise. Absolutely. Right. As with everything. I'm running. I haven't done that in, uh, like a whole year long. So. <laughs> But, you know, here's what I have a quick question, too. Uh, all these AI hoops, they say, you know, record your sound and they can play it back. Yep. And then, you know, uh, and then they play it to your grandparents and say, oh, you know, so and so, you know, need money and so on, right? <laughs> um, so, do those AI tools look at the physiological models? Maybe not yet, maybe one day they will. Yes. Oh, they're already. No, they're not, but that's where the, that's where the field is going. 
And in fact, it's something we are looking into as we are trying to recruit more faculty to the department, is how they can, um, their, their experiences and their, their research in that space. So I guess that's all I'll say about that. But it's certainly something we look forward to, especially when you think of individuals with neurodegenerative disease who are going to lose their voice, right? And this idea that we, of course, have, this, have our own unique vocal IDs and how we can have um, automated systems that sound like us when we lose our ability to voice, which ALS, for example, or Parkinson's is another example. So there's definitely work being done in that area and something and work that would align very well with larger, broader interests at the university here. I can come back to you, Maria. Yes. Um, with, uh, um, my question was, you talked about some of these exercises that resets the legs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples of these? Yeah, they're I kind of- they're very specific to individuals. But... Yeah, they'd be specific to individuals. So, so one way to think about it is, um, one way to think about it is this idea of forward focus or what's called resonant voice. So when we speak in order to be able to project our voices and in order to be able to sustain a healthy voice for a long time, where the, where the driving force needs to be is the front, is the face, the lips, the jaw, rather than the throat. Um, so the best way to do that is to, you know, when you're speaking, for example, is to place your hands around your cheeks and get a sense for where the vibrations seem maximally perceptible. Um, and using some of those tactile cues to really think about how you project your voice in a large room. So that's one way of doing it. There are very specific exercises uh, that we offer with, with, uh, with props. So one of the props we often use are straws because they help kind of lengthen the vocal tract and they're helping, they're, they're helping increase the distance from the sound source, which is the larynx, to where the sound propagates. And you can use, again, those straws as cues for how, to, um, for how to project your voice. So of course, this is all behavioral, right? So we are working with each individual and we are entraining the individual to kind of use these cues to best incorporate and generalize into everyday speech. But, yeah. Yeah, so that also brings me another question. Ask another one. But when, in, in, in emergency situations, when people integrate, Yes. Does that really affect the legs? Yes. So how do people recover from this? Yeah, so, with it, so intubations can result in things like granulomas um, in, in the posterior aspect of the larynx. And granulomas, the best, the best uh, course of action is surgical removal. So the granuloma is removed. There's, so there was clearly a mass or lesion on the vocal fold. The lesion is now removed. Um, invariably, there's some level of scarring. And the question is how you resolve that scarring. So it depends on the finesse of the surgeon. It depends on how long you were intubated. It depends on the diameter of the intubation tube. So there are lots of variables. But it also depends on how quickly you can get to voice therapy to kind of bring back mobility to that tissue in order to be able to sustain vibration. Like physical Absolutely, yeah, yeah, very similar, that's right. And similar principles, right, of specificity and so on. Yes, Oh, yes, sorry, so I have a question. So first of all, I was wondering, do you have any notion of how much time an average person spends talking per day and what would constitute sort of overuse? Like, is it like yeah, so, you know, just relates to your question too, Sarah. So, um, in general, the recommendation is that you not have more than two hours of continuous speaking. Continuous. Yes, yes. Um, you know, there are different studies. So there's a study that says the average speaker, you know, um, the distance the vocal folds cover in terms of vibration is about five miles a day, between four to five miles a day, just in terms of how much ground is being covered with vibration. Um, but I don't have any more specific data than that. All right. And I know you said so, because that there's a reset if you take yes. it, right? But um, is it also just cumulative damage, like the amount of cumulative damage over the day counts, or because you kind of restore, then having uh, one hour spread over time is much, much better than one hour all at once? But absolutely. So, yes. so things do accrue. And it's one of the reasons vocal rest is suboptimal to voice therapy. Uh, because the vocal rest will just reset the system, but it's not going to have any prophylactic effect that voice therapy would have. So, so, all those, so both those studies um, really showed that voice therapy is superior, but you know, I, I, there's also the aesthetics of doing voice therapy as you're walking across campus, right? Um, you, you, may, you may not want that level of publicity. 
being the person walking across the mall, you know, humming into a straw, for example. So, so voice rest is, is perfectly reasonable. Um, but, but there are other things we can do. So things like, you know, stretching the vocal folds through pitch glides, right? So being able to hum up several, several registers, going down the register. All those are kind of contracting and stretching the vocal folds in a very stair-step manner that can be helpful. Um, also as therapeutic exercises to reset the system. Yes. What is going on like biomechanically when I lose my voice? So what most likely what's happened, so it depends on what the trigger was for the voice, for the loss of voice. Um, but typically if you don't have voice, it's because your vocal folds are simply not able to make contact. So the challenge that we all navigate as speakers is you want the vocal folds to approximate. You don't want them to collide too much. You don't want them to be too far apart because that's not going to modulate the airflow, which is how sound propagates. So the other, th I'll, I'll come back to your question in just a minute as well. So the vocal folds, of course, open and close. And they stay closed for longer than they are open. And this is important because it, de it determines why our voices have such high harmonic energy. So what happens is the vocal folds stay closed for a longer time than they're open. And as they close, there's a sudden decline in that airflow coming between the vocal folds. And that airflow is actually the harmonic energy that's helping us project our voices. So in answer to your question, if anything impacts that closure or that closure is incomplete, you're not going to have any perceptible voice. You're going to be speaking in a whisper. So one reason you may lose your voice is because the, the tissue has atrophied and just doesn't have enough mass. The other reason you may lose your voice is because the vocal folds are inflamed and therefore the contact between them is not regular. So you're, 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 a lot of air is kind of being leaked, is leaky as the vocal folds are coming together. So there isn't a sustained buildup of pressure to push the vocal folds apart and sustain vibration. So most often the causes are inflammation and kind of generalized edema or significant atrophy of the tissue that's preventing contact. Chilla. So when, I, when we do vocal exercises, am I physically changing the structure or just learning how to do, the, do these exercises to incorporate the paper strategies to sound? To yeah, you are, so basically when you do vocal exercises, you are just improving the efficiency of voice production. You're mostly working on coordinating the different speech subsystems so that you're able to use the apparatus in a more optimal way. Or if I want, if I want a different voice, if I want to adopt a non-habitual voice, yes. so when, you, when I learn how to do that, yes. when I learn strategies to do that, am I changing the structure? Or is the only way to do that through surgery? The only way to actually change the structure would be surgery, yes. So that I sound different? Yes, all the time, yes. So what happens What's making the change in your voice when people inhale um, the helicopter? Oh, that's basically the, the, the medium over the vocal tract. It's the medium through which the air is propagating. It's not changing anything to your vocal folds itself. Yeah. Huh? It's the yeah, yeah, it's the density of the air. Yeah, yeah. So it's not changing the vocal folds. Right. No, I don't want to protect Pretty's voice. Too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. uh, and I want to uh, thank. Uh, uh, all the speakers this year. We've lined up four outstanding speakers for next semester already announced, including one that's going to be a channel performance here. Back to uh, from CRA. Uh, Preeti, thank you so much. I learned, we all learned a lot about the science behind our voice. And thank you for the leadership as well. Thank you. Thank you.